Isn't this gorgeous? This is a marine leg, and it's part of a huge grain elevator. That vertical part down the center is a conveyor belt, and it comes away from the building. It's hinged at the top, and it drops into the hold of grain-filled ships. And it roots around like a giant proboscis in the holds of these ships, and it picks up the grain in buckets and conveys it up to the top of the grain elevator. What I'm proposing to do today is to tell you just a little bit about why our buildings look the way they do. And to start out on that, I'm going to um, explain to you, particularly to those who, of you who don't find this so compelling, uh, why it is exactly that it moves us. And the us, in all cases here, is referring to me and to my partner in all things, Andy Burr. First, we have to look at that patina, the grays and the blues and those luscious stabs of rust that occur from oxidation. They weren't designed, they just happened. And we feel lucky when the results are so lovely. As the oxidation continues, ultimately, the panels of steel just disappear. And what we like is the surprising glimpse that it gives us, that you can look through inside the building now and you can see the X braces, you can see the beams, you can see the columns of steel, and you get a chance to kind of puzzle out what it is that holds this sort of lumbering structure together. And this passage of time also gives you this bittersweet feeling of nostalgia. You can wallow in feelings of those times gone by that always felt somehow better, simpler, more heroic than the times we live in today. And we aren't the only people who feel this way. This is a grain elevator. The marine legs, by the way, are on the other side of that building, on the water side. We're looking here from the land side. And these buildings were new in the 1920s and much photographed in the early decades of the uh, modern movement. This particular grain elevator was included by Le Corbusier in his 1929 Vers d'une architecture. And what he admired was the gutsiness of the engineers who designed these, who were willing to leave it looking just like this, unlike his architectural peers who would never be satisfied with a building like this, not until they had slathered it with a layer of ornamentation. So this is an example of pure form following function. We admire the repetition, and it's good to note the part shadows play in this in accentuating that repetition. And then there's the vicarious thrill of inhabiting those upper spaces. We all love to get up into those upper spaces, the penthouses with their million dollar views, the children who want to be king of the castle. That horizontal room at the top is called the distribution hall. And you can imagine the million dollar views from up there, you can imagine the noise, you can imagine how thrilling it would be to walk along there. Key to this is the windows, the windows that give it the scale, that give it the idea, that give us the idea that those are places that we could inhabit. Unlike this building, unlike modern industrial buildings, there's nowhere to go up there, um, nothing for us to inhabit. And talk about scale. Here, we love the scale crash here of these really large tubular concrete bins smashing down into the humble shed below. We love the ellipse it creates. We love the uh, shadows, that funky shadow that falls from one cylinder onto that other cylinder. It's hard to imagine anyone actually living in a building like this. And so far, no one has asked us to design a grain elevator. Houses are the mainstay of our practice. So we take you back 20 years ago when a client of ours bought a barn, this barn, and asked us to renovate it into a house. This was the first barn renovation we had done. And 20 years later, it looks like this. The middle part is the uh, uh, original barn, and all those buildings on the left and the right are additions that we have added over the past 20 years. This is what it looks like on the inside. You can see the barn boards there, and you can see the uh, beautiful, subtle colors of the uh, wood. And we, we kept the uh, walls all mossy earth tones to, to bring out those beautiful colors. This is how the house appeared in the New York Times Magazine uh, one Sunday to uh, our next client, who was sipping his latte in Palo Alto. And he asked us if we could do the same thing with 
his barn, which he had in Massachusetts. And we took a look at his barn and we told him we thought it was way beyond restoring and that he really should tear it down before it fell down and killed somebody. But he was undeterred. So he did demolish his barn, but he asked us if we would like to design a house for him with the same feelings that that barn had. So we, of course, said yes, please, and we did it. And it was the first time that we had started looking at barn buildings as um, resources, as inspiration for building houses. It was not hard for us to get excited about this because barns had these same simple shapes that we admired in the industrial buildings. They had mechanical parts. They even had clattering conveyor belts. They had repetition. They had quirky moves. And we began to realize that the barn form made sense for our most typical client, which is the vernacular lover on a budget. These people loved farmhouses, as exemplified by this uh, simple one on the right. It's dormers, it's uh, porches, the brackets, the complex shapes. All of this was exactly what they wanted, but it all costs a lot of money. And it's really hard to make a good looking farmhouse without cutting a lot of corners if you're on a budget. But then look at the barn on the left. It's got very simple forms, it's got minimal detailing, and it looks right like that. This is the first house we did for our vernacular lover on a budget. We realized pretty quickly that to look and feel barn-like, you couldn't have big picture windows, you couldn't have garage doors, and we devised a, a scheme for dealing with these things. We put the offending unbarny elements like these big windows and garage doors in the deepest shadow we could while letting the smaller barn-like windows come out onto the front facade. Here you see a detail of that house and on the right, hard to see because they're deep in the shadows, are eight foot high um, triple hung windows um, that look out onto the view and you can barely see the garage doors which are in the shadow and painted red on the lower left. We also love courtyards and look at the beautiful patina. Here's a house that we did using that courtyard feeling. Uh, it too is made up of barn-like forms, uh, three barn-like forms, three barns uh, with sheds that connect them. Here's another view of that. And you can see another device we used uh, for putting the larger windows into shadow is the, uh, this, this, these pent roofs, which were often used in barns to, um, to cover the tracks of sliding barn doors to keep them from rusting. Uh, and you can see here, this is a June day, and you can see that they are um, working very well as passive solar devices. You can see that the windows are com in complete shadow here. Um, which is what you want on a hot summer day. And in the winter, when the sun angle is so much lower, the sun streams right into the room. Here's the same building, and you can see a material that we use a lot. Corrugated steel, usually used in, in um, agricultural buildings. But it makes a lot of sense for our clients because it um, has factory paint that you never need to paint again. And it's no more expensive than clabberts. And the horizontal feeling of it gives you the feeling from any distance of something familiar. Here you can see expanses without windows. And here you can see another building. This is another house we did, farm buildings around a courtyard. Look at these uh, columns, th this, these granite columns um, that we made for the uh, garage, which is the building in the foreground. And I'll show you where we cribbed them from. This building has been a huge influence on us. It's part of the Hancock Shaker Village. And these granite columns we had always admired. And what they are, it's pretty interesting. They are fence posts, repurposed fence posts. You can see about um, three-fifths of them. The top three-fifths is nicely finished granite. But the bottom two-fifths is rough. And that's where they were buried into the ground. So the Shakers wanted to um, make the top part look really nice, but they left the bottom in its natural form. So we then began looking beyond barns to other quirkier, interesting forms from our industrial past. This is a fire station, and that tall tower was for drying hoses. And these are um, grain elevators uh, found on the prairies, and they have beautiful complex forms, yet somehow seem rather simple and solid and strong at the same time. 
factories and mills, we've always looked at a lot. And these windows at the top, they're not for uh, anybody to enjoy million dollar views, rather they are there to extend the working day of the poor urchins who worked here in the days before electricity. Uh, they needed as much light as they could get to extend the day. And here's another uh, beautiful example of how it was done in a um, factory in Harrisville, New Hampshire. And here's a page from a book that Andy discovered in the Williams College Library many years ago. And it's been really our Bible. It's called The Functional Tradition and Early Industrial Buildings. And the photographs are by Eric de Marais. And the things that we admire here, are up at the top, you can see the, uh, the banding, um, the clabberts, but with the banding in between. You can see the forms, that tall shape with the other horizontal shape coming in. On the lower one, you can see the beautiful smokestack. You can see on the left of that building, you can see the hoisting tower, a particular favorite motif. And the way the forms, the tall forms, intersect with the short forms um, and how beautiful that is. And here you can see all of these uh, put together in a house that we did in Alfred, Massachusetts. Um, you can see the hoist tower. You can see the overhang between the second floor and the first floor. You can see the clear story windows. And all of these are in a courtyard. Here's just a beautiful image. This is also from our favorite book. And these are buildings that were um, designed to dry nets. So it's drying hoses in one. This is drying fishing nets in this one. So the quirkiness of it is just so beautiful. And this is another influential set of buildings. This is Masmoka, just down the road from here. And this is the back lot part of it, where the public doesn't usually go. And so much to admire here. And by now, you can probably guess the sorts of things that we find compelling. The bridges, the different materials, the patina, the sequence of buildings, the courtyards, the serendipity of the found spaces. And we had a couple of clients um, about eight years ago who also admired these things greatly. There were two brothers, and they asked us to um, do two houses for them. And they had very different ideas of how to transform industrial architecture into residential architecture. One brother, he wanted his to be very plain on the outside, like a butler building. Um, and he had this idea of sort of a chaotic landscape on the inside. The second brother wanted the reverse. He wanted his inside very simple uh, and the outside to read a, like a narrative, more like this. And it's this brother's house that I'm going to show you. So here you can see the hoisting tower slid down the roof. You can see on the left their garages, and we did those in the sort of the idea of the concrete block buildings of the 1930s. And on the right, you can see a bridge like at Mass Mocha, which you can see better here, the light gray part. He's got a shop here on the left. Um, and then on the right, there's a brick building, which one can imagine might have been the first building in the assemblage. In between the windows of the brick building, you can see a black box with a stovepipe, and that's the fireplace, which you can then see here on the inside. And here's the front hall of his house, and here's the kitchen with the 23-foot-long stainless steel countertop. This is a photograph by Burnt and Hilla Becker. This is a uh, winding tower, it's called, and, and there's an elevator from, that goes down into the ground, gets coal. This is in the Ruhr Valley in Germany. And we love the windows on the top. We love the openings that it creates. We love the bridges. We love the trusses. The whole assemblage is, is just beautiful. Here's another one that we particularly like. Instead of horizontal, now this one has a vertical feeling. On the uh, top there, you can see the three windows uh, on one on top of each other, and then a slit, a long vertical window on the left. And we did manage to work that into our building on Spring Street, the uh, B&L building. And you can see in the center part there, you can see the vertical slit on the left-hand side there. Um, it does have floors in there, but we kept them receded and we kept them in black, very much in contrast to the brighter, further to the surface brick. Um, so we think it reads pretty much as a vertical slit and then the three windows on the right. So this is our little homage to the Beckers. And garage doors to, and the uh, steel lintels there all were sort of industrial 
um, moves. As buildings got larger in their footprint, the strategy of having windows on the periphery, even up in the roof, uh, didn't get as far into the middle of the buildings as the factory owners would like. So they developed this idea of ribbons of windows um, that ran along the roof of the building um, that would bring light way into the interior. Unfortunately, you can imagine with those V's that they form, um, snow and the rain um, fills them up and eventually makes their way into the buildings and rots them and they fall down. And as soon as electricity became a cheap alternative, the strategy of uh, using sawtooth roofs disappeared until now. So this is a building that we did uh, in Alford, Massachusetts. So our strategy here was use these sawtooth roofs so that you can get shafts of south light all the way through the building and this is three of the sawtooths and you'll see that there are more and you can see if you look inside you can see the shafts of sunlight making their way inside in order to uh, not have that leakage problem uh, what we did was we tipped the whole roof structure so on this side the wall is four feet higher than it is on the other opposite side so that the rain can drain out of each of these sawtooth sections and this is the most recent building we've just completed you can see three south-facing uh, clear story windows here. But this building was a little different because the clients were not vernacular lovers. They were classic modernist building lovers. They showed us these pictures of a house that Marcel Breuer built in 1959. And um, the things that they admired were the, the stones on the uh, on wall that came right into the building and these framed openings out of stone. And so here you can see what we ended up with for them. This is, this is the same house you saw with the clear story windows, but this is from the other side. This is looking up from their pond. This is the screened in porch, that part on the upper right. And these are the stairs going up from the lower level up to the terrace above. And you can just see on the upper right there, you can see one of the clear story, um, one of the sawtooth roofs peeking up there against the sky. We used a different material on this house, and it's the first time we've done that, and it's, it's slate, slate, just the same slates that you would use on a slate roof. There are two nail holes at the top of the slate, but we had them turn it sideways and put the two nail holes on the side so that when you hang them like this, overlapping, um, you get a more horizontal feeling than when you mount them on the roof. Here's inside, and here you can see this is looking from a study in the house and you can see out the left you can see a piece of stone wall and you can see it reappearing on the inside on the right so it's just like in that Breuer building that they admired and this this is an unbuilt project that fit the thesis that we're discussing today so well that I wanted to include it this is um, a building that we hope will eventually get built. It's um, supposed to be an annex um, to the Porches Inn in North Adams, and it's across the road from the um, beautiful old factory buildings of Mass Mocha. And here we're trying to take as our inspiration the beauty of the ruin, the beauty of the ruined factory buildings, the broken glass, the nature coming inside the building. The only part of the building here that is um, enclosed is that highest piece and the block right below it. Other than that, it's all an open porch. The rest of that facade is a framework, a steel framework, um, steel beams with some steel windows included in the frames and within those occasional window frames, occasional pieces of glass. And the glass that we did use in all of it were um, different colors of, of blue and green and clear to sort of evoke uh, that sloppy window repair aesthetic that is really actually quite beautiful. And inside you see we, we're proposing to have trees growing inside like you might see in an old, in an old ruin. And finally, a winding tower becomes a house, if only for the birds. So, thank you.